Hospital Porter's pride and dignity stop the new world order. Welcome to Hapanwo TV. Right, I've moved around the corner from the main road where I was earlier, because um, that was the Woodstock Road, um, which is a bit busy where the entrance to the hospital is, or whether the old hospital and the Green College. I'm now on Observatory Street, which is uh, a little side road on the, near the other side of the building. I'm quite glad I stopped filming, actually, for, not just for the reasons I told you, but because um, I didn't realise it, but my film chip had nearly run out. And what happens if the film chip runs out, the film just stops, it just cuts off, and that completely ruins the kind of narrative. So I'm quite glad I actually stopped filming at that point. Um, so I've, uh, I've, I've put in a new chip and um, ready to start filming again. And here you see where I am, because there, as you see, is Green Templeton College. Now, as you see, it's a tower, it's kind of hexagonal, it's an uneven hexagon, with various strange symbols all over it. You see there, there's, I don't know what these mean, but there's things, I saw a lobster, I mean, you're sure you might have seen that on the, on the first film. There was a lobster. As you see here, there's, there's two guys holding up the world there, a kind of um, twin atlases. As I said, you know, this is a, you may not be watching this because I might not have uploaded it. Obviously, if you are watching it, it means I've uploaded it. But um, I'm going to tell you something a bit personal happened in that building there a long time ago when I was a kid. Now what happened was um, I went to a wedding reception there when I was about probably about 10 years old, I think. And um, one of the other boys there, a lad about my own age, um, tried to commit suicide. What, what it is, now that, that tower I showed you, it's, it's modelled on the Tower of Winds in Athens. And it's, um, what you have there is, is below there's a kind of function area where the wedding reception was taking place. Um, and um, the tower itself is like, like a spiral staircase running up inside the tower. And, like, and uh, a gallery, a little gallery by the window so you can look out at the top. And um, it's a very wide open spiral staircase. And um, with a big, big well in the middle. The, the staircase runs along the, along the walls. Now what happened was, um, this little boy, we were at the top near the gallery. And um, a young, the, this boy, climbed onto the, climbed onto the banister. And a good hundred foot drop above the, the hard floor below him. Uh, somebody, I think it was my dad actually, shouted, Get off there! And he sort of, he seemed to go into a trance and he snapped out of it. Do you know what I mean? Um, just gonna take a walk down here because it's Adelaide Street, yeah. I wonder what the SSS stands for. Who, who knows? Um, anyway, um, now, um, I'd forgotten all about this. It had gone out of my head until I read a book called Dogged Days. I'll put a link in the description box to my review of it and another article I've written, I've written discussing this. Now, Dogged Days is by my friend Ellis Taylor, um, who is known on YouTube as Other World Journeys and um, has a website called lsctaylor.com. And um, if you go to the Hapanmo blog, there's a link in the links column to that. Now, this book, Dogged Days, talks about Templeton College and the tower. And you see, he, he, Ellis says there are. Uh, it's very esoteric, and there's, there's an underground, there are underground catacombs beneath the tower, as there are in many parts of Oxford, which is a story we'll discuss at another time. But, um, what, what happened at this wedding reception seems to have significance for me because of who the groom was. Now, the man getting married was a friend of my my mum and dad's, and um, I'll call him Centaur. I'm not going to tell you his real name. Um, now Centaur... I mean, I say he's a friend of my mum and dad's, but I mean, that's just the wrong word. He was my mum and dad, he was God to them. I mean, he literally was... They worshipped him. What, what, how, how can someone worship another person, you might ask? Well, uh, strange, really. Now, what was he like? What was Centaur like? Well, he was this rather scruffily dressed man, a uh, big mop of untidy hair. He looked rather like Ben Goldacre, actually. In fact, I mentioned in my review of Ben Goldacre's book that, and his speech that um, this bloke looked just like him. Um, but he, but it's, he was, he was uh, very calm. Now, now he, was, he was a very, very calm, quiet man. Very, very charming and, cha you know, very, very, uh, very, very s sophisticated. Like to talk, you know. He was a quite a posh bloke, you know. He was a teacher, um, 
and he's very learned and he always smiled like that and um, everybody he had a wide circle of friends and everyone thought everyone thought he was so, 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 so. he was kind of like you say well what a what a charming nice man he is he's one of those people now um the thing about it was though he it was it was all an act it was all on the surface that's what he was on the surface but you see but behind that there was a very very different kind of man indeed and I know that because um, see he he was abusing me when I was a child he was extre he was capable of extremely brutal and abusive behavior and I'm talking about um, I'm talking he was a very very physically abusive to me he was violent towards me um, he was uh, he was emotionally cruel, emotionally manipulative, and that's just what I can remember. I don't like to think about what I can't remember about what he did to me. Um, now, we hear this all the time, you know, that you get somebody who's just perfect. They're just socially perfectly people. They're just socially perfect people. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen a film, American Psycho, and it's based on a book. Um, but uh, that's a good example, because uh, he, the, the character, the main character in American Psycho is, uh, an, on the surface, he's an absolutely perfect person, young, handsome, successful, charming, sociable, and all, all, all those things, you know, all those other cliches. And you've got to watch out for people who are too perfect like that, because very often, they're hiding something. If they're just, there's a bit of wind here, let's get out of the wind. If they're just too perfect, and um, they lack, they lack, they, they lack kind, uh, kind of, um, you, they lack individuality. There's no kind of, um, there's no kind of like, a, there's no character to them as such. There's no sort of like um, individual. There's no kind of um, honest. It's a kind of genuine sort of uniqueness about them. I don't know how to describe it. Now. Um, there is, there, is, there is some answers, there are answers here, all right? And um, they're many faceted and they come from many people. And it's quite a controversial subject, but um, you often hear the words... Now, if you go to um, sot.net, S-O-T-T, sign of the times, they talk a lot about this, and they talk about the 6% of people who are psychopaths. And, um, you know, and there's other people, you know, Laura Knight Yadchik writes about this a lot, and there's books you can get, like there's snakes in suits when psychopaths go to work, and the sociopath next door, and um, there's a new book come out called Women Who Love Psychopaths, which is uh, written by a lady who's written some several articles, which are very good. And it's called that, it, despite the title, you know, it's not just really for women, it's, it's for everyone, because psychopaths can be both male and female. Uh, in fact, um, a third of them are, are female, and um, they're not just they're not just somebody you you become a, a partner of or a boyfriend or girlfriend of. They can be people in your, any any aspect of your life. They can be people you work with. They can be people um, you have friend you are friends with. People who are at your school. Anyone. Now, um, um, Centaur was one of these people, I think. And I, I mean, there's lots of other theories as well. I mean, I think there's a link between uh, between this phenomenon. And what David Icke talks about when he mentions the reptilians, and also, and there's other theories like this. Um, um, Ted Twitmeyer talks about the black-eyed people. Now you hear a lot about black-eyed kids because there's there's all kinds of reports coming out, especially in America, people encountering black-eyed kids. But um, these are like black black-eyed people. I mean, they're very often they're adults as well. You know, they're very often adults. Now. Um, there's other people, there's like um, Amitak Stanford calls them organic portals. But I mean, no one's entirely, it's a bit, it's no one's ever, there's no real definitive um, explanation of what these kind of individuals people are, or these, these beings who masquerade as people. Um, it's also, I mean, we're not sure also 
what actually causes them? I mean, is it, is it some, does something happen to people in their upbringing and their education to turn them in like this? Or are they born that way? I mean, Laura Knight Yadchik says they're born that way. It's actually a brain disorder. Or it's, um, there's other people say they have no soul. I mean, this is, this is a recurring statement people make. They say, that person has no soul. Well, I mean, that's, you know, it's, that's a bit vague because, I mean, I don't know what a soul is, quite frankly. I mean, I don't think anyone really is entirely sure, but it's, um, it's what a lot of the people who encounter these creatures and these beings say. And in fact, I think I'm one of them. You know, for better or worse, that's the explanation I can give you for Centaur. Now, there's, there's a saying that the eyes are the window of the soul. Right. Well, you know, sometimes you look into some when you look into someone's eyes, and you find there's nobody home, and that's certainly the case with Centaur. I, I, his, his eyes were like this. They're wide, staring eyes like that, and they never, they never change. And he sings, even though his, you know, he was, um, he was extremely cool and unemotional. Nothing ruffled him. Do you know what I mean? Nothing raised any kind of emotion in him. Even when he was behaving violently, he was he wasn't he was extremely sort of like calculated violent. He was like a robot being violent. And he was robotic. And um his, his, he had these wide staring eyes, but there were life there was no life in his eyes. It's hard to say, describe, but there was some essential you know, these eyes were anatomically normal, but there was some essential ingredient missing, some spark of life. They looked like the eyes of a corpse. He looked like they'd been painted onto his face. And they were like this. He used to smile like this. You know, he'd have this really artificial smile. And, um, he, like I say, nothing ruffled him and he never showed any emotion. But he laughed occasionally. But his laugh was... His laugh, he, he, he laughed very... He, always, he used to go... Ah! Very loudly. And he'd suddenly stop and, he, and his head would go like that. And he'd be back to normal. You know, he'd be completely... So his, his laugh was, ah, and then back to normal. Now that's, that's very unusual for people. You hear people laughing, they don't normally laugh like that. So um, he was one of these people, one of these creatures or beings, whatever you want to call them, if you can call them people. Maybe people's the wrong word. Because um, I don't think he was human. I don't think he is. I don't think these creatures are human. Whatever, if they ever had anything human in them, it was taken out of them somehow. Now, we all hear about politicians, people in power, have been these psychopaths, you know. Not just people, not just sort of like uh, bad guys of history like Hitler and Stalin, but Tony Blair. People say Tony Blair is a psychopath. Um, Sarah Palin, people like that. Well, um, it's not just people, it's not just prominent politicians, though. It is... Uh, it's ordinary, it's people you meet in the street. Hello. Someone just gave me a wave. Daisies, that's a nice name for a, for a company. It's people you meet on the street. Now, um, they're people you meet in your normal life. Now, well, as I said to this, this man is someone who, um, who was extremely, um, extremely unpleasant towards me. And he could, he could be extremely... These creatures often are extremely unpleasant to people. When they can get away with it. They'd be extremely unpleasant to people. Now, um... What, what hurt, the, re the really painful thing was, is another aspect of the, of the psychopath stroke, reptilian stroke, black-eyed person stroke, soulless person, whatever you choose to call them. Um, and that aspect is, you know, despite everything I just told you, they oft they have an, a, a strange kind of appeal. They have a strange kind of um, seductiveness about them, like a siren pulling you into your doom. And for certain kinds of people, you know, maybe people have a weakness and they're not on their guard. Um, you, it's, you can very, very, they seem to have a kind of um, almost irresistible attraction. And uh, Centaur was like that. He had lots of girlfriends. He's very popular with women. He has many, many girlfriends. Um, and um, well, it's 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 a bit that's a bit of a painful subject. But he he was involved with people in my family. 
That's enough. I'll, I won't say any more than that, okay? Um, but um, the, thing, the thing about it was, he, as I said earlier, I, when I described what my mum and dad felt about him, it's like he was God. I mean, they they actually changed whenever he was about, and he was about an awful lot, I'll tell you, because he was, he was in our house every damn evening, all evening. He was there all weekend, hanging around my mum and dad. And um, they changed, they, they became different people when he was around. I mean, they, my mum and dad, obviously, they were they, particular kind of personalities, like people are, and they act in a particular way. When Centaur was around, they changed, and they both became, like, the same. And they became, like, kind of... It's, it's, they became, like, a... Almost like an utterly devoted dog to him, you know. Utter, utterly... Utterly subservient. Completely and utterly... Um, it's a fly on my camera. Okay. Completely and utterly... Uh, wrapped around his little finger. And this is, you know, the, the, the hold he had over them was so powerful that, you know, he even on occasions abused me in front of them. I mean, he, he, he once hit me, he once physically assaulted me in front of my mum and dad and a lot of other people. And they stood there like sheep and they didn't do anything. If someone did that to my daughter in front of me, it would be the last thing they ever did. But my mum and dad just stood there like sheep, so did everyone else. And afterwards, they came, they, you know, my mum came to me and said, you know, it's, he was very sorry when he did that. He was very, very sorry. Centaur didn't mean it, using his real name. He was very, very sorry. And you were misbehaving, you know. You were really misbehaving. Like it was my fault. <laughs> like it's somehow mitigating circumstances. It's just, uh, you know, an attempt to justify it. It was... Um, no, it took me a long time to forgive my mum and dad for that. But I did, because, I mean, it's... They just, um, they just have a kind of um, weakness for, for, for creatures like Centaur. What, what, the good news is, you know, that, um, well, he got, when he got married, it was quite a relief, really, because he spent less time with us, because he, he only called around maybe three or four times a week instead of uh, seven or eight times a week, you know? <laughs> um, but he, funnily enough, he moved into a house just down the road from us. He married a very well-to-do woman, um, she was a doctor or something, and he went up in the world, he had a lot of money. He went and moved into a house just down the road. Uh, and I think, I really think he chose that location because he wanted to be close to my mum and dad because he enjoyed the power he had over them. I really do. Now, um, now in, in 2002, I went round to my dad's, mum and dad's house. My mum was alive in those days. And I found him sitting there. And my mum and dad were sitting around him, kissing his ass like they always used to. Anyway, I, I basically, like, luckily I, I flipped. And you'll be glad to know that I basically frog marched him out of the house and then I walked off. And my dad just came after me and said, what did you do that for? Why did you do that? Why? See, this is what I mean, you know. Um, well, my mum my mom passed away, but my, my dad is still in denial about the whole thing. And whenever my dad talks about Centaur, his, he, he has this... He, he puts on this kind of... This rhapsodic kind of starry-eyed look comes over his face. And I think that man still has a psychological hole over my dad. And I'm terrified that he might try and get into my dad's life again. If he does, I'll go, you know, I'll, I'll go around there and I'll do everything I can to persuade my dad not to. But I still am scared of that. I'm still worried about that. But I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, the thing is, when, when he slapped me, when he used to slap me around and beat me up, I was just a little kid. I was like 10, year, eight, 10 years old. He, he came into my life when I was about eight years old. Um, obviously now, um, time's gone on a little bit. He's, a, he's an old man now. He's about 65. And me? Well, I'm a lot bigger than he is now. So I don't think he's going to try and uh, try that on me again. I don't think he'd... Uh, I think he, he, likes, he, he likes victims who can't fight back. Um, now, where does all this fit into Green College, you might ask? Right. Well, um, like I said, I mean, after talking it over with several people, including Ellis and reading Ellis's book, and knowing what Ellis has told me about the esoteric elements of Green College and that tower and what's underneath and everything, and 
I wonder actually if um, Centaur was somehow involved in the esoteric nature of that location and maybe there's the, the link here between the fact that this boy tried to kill himself I can't prove it it's all speculation but it's funny you know there's a, there's a place which I find out has esoteric elements to it I go to where Centaur gets married I go to his wedding reception in that place and a boy tries to kill himself coincidence possibly Anyway, like I said, you know, I've written an article in the, it's in the description box where I describe all this. Also, I mean, if, you, if, you read, if you've been reading my novel, The Obscurity Chronicles, where I've been putting, um, I've been putting little bits of it up on Ben's bookcase. I'll put a link into the, the segment where there's a, there's a character in it called Simon Danbury, right? Well, Simon Danbury is, he is Centaur. I mean, I, I'm not, my, I'm not, I'm not exactly like uh, Glyn, the character in the book, the little boy in the book, and you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that <coughs> Glyn's family, is sap, uh, family like my family, or that Glyn's mum and dad are like my mum and dad, but Centaur is in there, and what everything that Centaur does is put down there in in fictional allegory. Right, well. Uh, this has been a, a personal, a bit of a personal revelation for me now. I haven't talked about this before on camera. Um, if you if you bought, if you if you're watching this, it means obviously I chose to upload it. So, um, you, so uh, that's it. I've, uh, you've, it's all out in the open. But I mean, like I said, you've got to beware of people like that. And this book, the book "Women Who Love Psychopaths," it has a, it has a kind of. Um, a kind of list of things to check for, you know, to warn people, you know, how you spot these creatures and these beings, and um, how you distinguish them from normal humans. And uh, there's, there's, because they can be, if you're on your guard against them, you can spot them. As I said, one of the, they're sort of like the too perfect person, the too normal, the person who's too normal and not and has no sort of like characteristics of their own, is is a dead giveaway. And as I said, I mean, this is not a this is a purely subjective thing, really, but the eyes. Look into their eyes and see what you see there. And if you, if you are sensitive to these things, you'll be able to spot them. And if, you, if, if other things ring alarm bells, you know, I'm not just saying going by what people's eyes look like, but if other things along with that ring alarm bells, then you'll know. Now then, if, if, one, of these, if one of these beings happens to come near you and you, you identify them, Get away from them. Keep keep away from them. Keep them away from you and your loved ones. It's very important that. As I said, you know, there's there's, there's online resources where you can look for things. Sot.net, Ted Twitmeyer, um, Dot Connector magazine is very good for things like that. They have a lot of articles on this subject. So. Uh, that really explains everything, and, it's, um, and here we are, we come back to the tower there. Green Templeton College, the location maybe of esoteric matters and wedding receptions for psychopaths. Thank you for watching Hapanwo TV. Hospital port as pride and dignity stop the new world order.